Owl Hat Radio. You call Hat Radio TV. Hello. You call Hat Radio TV. This is You Call That Radio. This is You Call That Radio TV, and tonight we've got an absolute legend on the show. Absolutely buzzing. We've got Karen Dunbar on the show, who's an absolute hero of mine. Delighted to have her on the show. If the first time you've tuned in, this you call it radio. We've done over 300 shows since lockdown began, and we just speak to different artists and people from the community, from the underground up. We talk about the meaning of life, art, and sometimes we just talk about 10 pence crisps. So there might be a bit of both of that today. Without further ado, I'm going to bring Karen on the show. Karen, how are you doing? Hello, Mark. Hello, everybody. I've dressed up, I've made an effort for the night, so I know it might be quite a lot for some of you to see somebody so um, beautiful at this time of night, you won't expect <laughs> it, but what all can much, say, but, your eyes. Well, I even put on a bit of aftershave as soon as I seen that Key Adams had retweeted you. Oh, that's so, nice. It's a dupe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, only, the, only the best, only the best. And I don't think it's I don't think it's I don't think it's too far flung to say that you are a national treasure. You know it's a national treasure when your Auntie Alice texts you to say good luck for the show tonight. And, I just uh, your Auntie Alice as well. How are you doing, Alice? Hello, Auntie Alice, and happy birthday to, to Dawn yesterday, I believe, as well. And I've a happy a happy anniversary to my mom and my stepdad. And hello, Da, who's who's I'll probably be bringing this on DVD format to later on. I met you once before, Cam, very, very briefly. I don't think you remember it. We did meet, we did have a proper wee bit of a chat last week for the uh, the the hang conference, which we'll talk a little bit in a minute. But I met you in the real world once at TED Talk. And uh oh, I, I'm so good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was I was like, I had to I had to actually get a wee selfie with you because I'm a, a massive fan of your work. So um thank That's you fun. for doing this. Oh, you're really welcome. And in the Hang Conference, we'll talk about that quickly as well, because that's how we, we sort of uh, met. So it's, it's the Hang Conference. I'm going to put the link in the comments for people to check it out. But we had a really good wee chat, didn't we? There was, there was ourselves and about another five panellists talking about hip-hop in the community. And it was my good friend, Alana, that asked me to do the show. And she was, went, she was going through everybody who was in the panel. And she went, Karen Dunbar. And I'm like, Karen, we're hip-hop. And I, I mean, I, I was surprised by that. Uh, it was so, so what is the deal with you and, and hip-hop? When did that begin? Well, I've always had a love of hip-hop, so I have. <laughs> Actually, that's true. I'm doing a lot of character, but it is true. But when I'm saying hip-hop, I, I wouldn't even begin to pretend that I was any aficionado with it. Um, but I'm talking about, like, pop, hip-hop, um, stuff that was in the charts, um, uh, vaguely, and a lot of stuff off soundtracks as well. So... With that, coupled with an idea that I had before the lockdown, I wanted to get together with groups of folk and uh, make some music. That's the gist of it. I didn't really care who it was, how we did it. I just wanted to see what that would be like. Um, anyway, I'd never had the time for it. Lockdown hit. This is a bullet point, so you can ask me in between. Lockdown hit, and uh, after about three months, I was trying to write some things. I was trying to write theatre things, stand-up comedy. Couldn't connect to it. And this idea about the... Uh, uh, again, it's hard for me to call hip hop workshops or that because all it was in my head was get into a room with folk or a Zoom room with folk and make some music. So that's the gist of it, Mark. And for that, it's it's taking off in a way <clears throat> I can't quite handle. <laughs> it's a bit much, but um, when I say it's a bit much, it's been fantastic um, for the reasons to get up in the morning during lockdown creativity things in my head right I'm doing this I'm doing that but mainly the connection with the people that I've met through it and the work that's been done on it and had had no idea about the therapeutic value which all sounds a bit airy fairy um but other than that I was coming away for some of the uh, workshop sessions shutting the laptop and I was like ah. man can I swear on I can I swear on this yes no you can you can you can swear definitely I okay. I was like, ah, bloody Nora, and I was like, ah, fuck me, that was really, <laughs> that was really powerful, do you know? So, for that, and that was at the beginning of them, I started off with a group of refugees, I was doing it 
I was doing it for nothing. It's like, right, lassies, hello. And they were all, like, some of them on their phones and things like that. Says, this is what we're going to do. Uh, we're just going to put some ideas together. You're going to write some stuff. We're going to make it rhyme. And we're going to put it all together into a rap. And I'll make the music for you. I didn't know how to do that. I've got Garage Band. I faffed about with that for a while. And then, like anything, if you practice it long enough, you start getting used to it if you watch enough YouTube videos. Um, and then I had to go into like Logic Pro, the um, program on Mac, because it was getting too big. Uh, too big, but uh, it was too big for Garage, but too big for Garage Band. You're gonna you, need you to got, you got too big for Garage Band. Well, that's, do you know, um, Gordy Duncan Jr., my, my drummer in my band, he used Garage Band for about 20 years, and he's just moved finally to Logic Pro in the last few months. But right. he was just, he just loved Garage Band. You couldn't tell, you couldn't, you couldn't get him off it, but he's, he's, uh, eventually, there's just more stuff that you can do. So, what, right. kind of, what kind of beats is it you're making then? Are you sticking to the kind of pop side of things, or is it no, a bit of a mixture? Would I play your stuff? I would love to hear some stuff, eh? Well, uh, anybody that is watching, but like, this is a setup, and then blah, blah. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I'm like, right, hold on a minute, because you've got to remember at the same time, I'm a 50 year old woman. So, bear with me. I know that kind of pit. Bear with me. I was 50 this well, year. That's... Well, congratulations. You look great. Yeah. Uh, well, you look uh, fantastic. I, I there's a private, there's a private chat here, right? So if you want to send me a link, I could, I can play it from that. If you want to send me something in the private chat, hopefully by the end of the show we will be able to hear some of your original music. That'd be, that'd be cracking. I'd love that. Well, right, hold on. Sorry, viewers, but see when you say, <laughs> see when you say send it to a private chat. What do you mean? <laughs> so, right, you know, you said hello to me when you first arrived backstage. I'll write a hello Hi. back to you. So that's how you private link. So if you send a link to there, like a copy yeah. and paste the URL, then I can play well, it. Well, I've only people. got it on Logic. All right, okay. So, yeah, that might be tricky. We'll figure that out. We'll figure yeah, that well, out as we go. Well, I've got it. Set. I, think, I think you can also share your screen as well, but let's not try and do the technical stuff. We'll maybe try and mess a bit with that later on. Hey, but let's just see who's, let's see who's tuned in. Sharon Drysdale, yeah, so happy to be back with you. Call that radio gang, making me smile to see you, Karen. Big love. Hello, Sharon. How are you, Mary? There's Mary W. Mary Big W. Mary. Mary W. In the house. Happy anniversary to Mary W. Uh, Gary Cox. Great to see you in here, Karen. Oh, Gary. Hi, Gary. We've got Donna in the house. Homegrown always best. Who who you Donna. can see on the panel? Other Mora. Yeah, I didn't really describe that. I didn't. I got. I didn't really explain the panel that well. But I put in the comments there. I will link to the panel, which is on the thirty first of July. That's uh, been run by Richie and Alana at the Sam Awards. So it's going to be a whole bunch of great panels, and there's going to be a live music gig at the SWG three after it. So you can get free tickets to watch all the panels by just registering on Eventbrite. And I think you can pay a fiver to actually go to the SWG three and see real live music. I believe. Uh, I think it will be. I think it'll be sitting down and socially distanced because obviously we don't want people to have too much fun. But, you know, nearly there, nearly there. Who else we got here? We've got um, good good uh, evening, Earthlings. Hope everyone is well. Greg, I hope you're well too. Paul's in the house. Two Paul's in the house. In case somebody, something comes up and it's like, can you mind that money you owe me? You're going <laughs> to make sure you vet things just in case. No, I do. I do. I vet. I vet. I vet. I'm pettier than pet school. I've got Becky Wallace in the house. Hello, Becky. Hiya, Hopefully Becky. We'll get... Becky might be on the show next week. I was just chatting to her earlier about that. I think she's got a sitting down social, uh, social distance gig next Saturday at the room two. So we'll get Becky on to talk about that next week. Uh, good to see her. Karen also buzzing for hangs. Says Sanjeev. Hello, Amazing. mate. Amazing. Been looking forward That's to this. Excellent language for uh, love, by the way. So... Because I was doing that, which is Satanism. So I see if you just do that, it turns it in. Gainer's in the house as well. Good to see Gainer. Hello, folks from Vietnam. Had to see one of the best talents in Scotland. We've got Dope Sick Fly in the house. Amazing. And we've got Lover So Daily. Her con contribution to the arts is under underrated, I think. I think she's in there. And we've got Louise as well. Right, okay, I'm not going to just read. Well, if you've got anyone who's got a question for Karen, they do. I'll try and read them out later on. But we'll talk about the, the arts and stuff. Let's talk about the arts and stuff. Go so, then. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, obviously, I, I knew all your stuff from, well, Chewing the Fat and the Cam Dunbar show were, were amazing to me growing up. Just curious how, how you got involved in all of that stuff. It was, was comedy your main thing? Because, obviously, 
you've done lots of stuff with theatre and, and part of mine, all sorts of stuff as well. But was comedy your first love and, and how did you get involved in like, chewing the fat? Let's yeah. start there. Right, well, to answer that question, was comedy your first love? No, I'll tell you what, was, music was my first love and it will be my last. Music from the future and music from the past. That's for your Auntie Alice. Anyway, um, so no, it was mere music, Mark. Um, I wanted to be a singer when I was wee. In fact, that's not strictly true. What I wanted to be, wait for it, was on telly. Look at me now. There you are. Um, and so when I was tiny, about four or five year old, and people say, what is it you want to be? What is it you want to do when you grow up here? And other folk were saying, you know, a fireman or police or nurse or that. I was like, ah, on the telly. That was my only answer. So I came from poor work class background, no education, no money, no nothing. Um, I'm the, no, no support as in my mother and father weren't they really that kind of encouraging. That's not true. Father used to take me around to the Labour Club, not because there was any political affiliations, but because the booze was cheap on a Sunday. Uh, and my big sister would go around as well. She was a lot older than me. And I would go up on stage and sing big round of applause. Could see that on the telly and was like, ah, that's what I want to do. Get big rounds of applause, basically. So I thought it would be through singing. And so that's uh, what I thought my way into that was. But the comedy sort of came more. I mean, when I say I was funny at school, like my pals thought I was funny and the teachers thought it was a pain in the ass. So I would get put out, uh, kind of thing. Uh, the, you know, the a liability. Mark, do me a favour, will you? Going to come back on screen? That's yeah. Very- because all I can see is myself and I'm too much for myself. I'll just I'll get carried away. I'll start, you know, I'll be like, ah, look at your lovely chin. So <laughs> I can see you and then I'll behave myself. Um, and um, aye. So I, I'm rushing this, so stop me because I'm... No, I, no, there's, we've got, oh, there's, 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 there's no there's rush at all. There's no rush at all. Um, but So my point is... Into comedy, I started to, when karaoke came out at the beginning of the 90s, I was working in a bar that my boss says, to, I was a barmaid, says, Karen, you can sing. There's this thing called karaoke coming out. I want you to host it. Um, and I was, I mean, I was over the moon, but at the same time, I was totally shite myself. I mean, my first hosting was, I was doing this, I used this electronic flag as a microphone because I like a prop. I'd be like, ah, first singer's Jean. Up you come, Jean. And Jean would come up and sing a song, she'd sing Top of the World, and I'm like, a big hand for Jean. Next, it's Billy. Right, Billy. That was my hosting skills. <laughs> um, but it really took half the karaoke. So it was on the Wednesday night, then it was on Wednesday, Thursday, then it was Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday. Then, and this was in air. I was brought up in air. Then it was on uh, the, the pub in Glasgow. It was bonkers in Glasgow. So they put me on bonkers. Aye, put me on bonkers. The 50, 50 pence a bottle of Budweiser or something. Aye, and big. I think that was, that was one of the first places that did the uh, bit like big jugs of booze, uh, big pitchers. So you get two pound, uh, pound pitchers, a cider and lager and everything. Big office party and things like that. Um, but for that, I started my own karaoke business. Um, and then I moved into pubs and clubs on my own and then started DJing as well. So it was a big pub club entertainment uh, thing that I was involved in. And the gay scene in Glasgow, Delmonica's had just opened, uh, which was next to the polo. That was long before the polo lounge. Um, and Club X, which was in Royal Exchange Square. Wait, no, I can't even remember where it is now. And then Bennett's, I was DJing in there, and then I went through to Edinburgh, DJing karaoke there. And for that, I went uh, for an audition. Again, these are bullet points, so I can ask me about these. I went for an audition. Um, for, with a comedy unit, uh, it, it wasn't a virtue in the fact, it was just open auditions and uh, I thought I would never hear from them again and they phoned me the next day and asked me to come in because the audition was mud, but uh, they were just, if, I'm sure you've seen flash dance, Mark, because you just you know, <laughs> the paper guy that sits up and watches that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, I, I did the audition and I'm not kidding you, it was that uh, I dressed up as an old woman and I made up a, a story about Camden Bar and tell them about the old woman as Camden Bar. Basically, so when I'm saying I dressed up as an old woman, that's called acting. And when I'm saying I tell them a story, but that's called script writing. Do you know what I mean? That's it's as simple as that. Um, anyway, so it was an old was an old woman like Margaret. Margaret, you mean Betty? Well, oh, Betty. Betty, sorry, Betty. Aye, no, Betty. No, it wasn't quite. It was mere based on my pal's mum. Uh, 
who was called Mary. Um, and so, they, but they were total pan, you know, they were totally pan faced at the end of it and everything. And they were like, thanks very much for coming in. Thought, I'll never hear from them again. But they phoned me the next day and says, right, in you come and like have a chat with us. Uh, and I didn't realise comedy unit were making rap scene is bit and things like that. I was just turned up. Tune the fact was on the radio at the time, and they says, right, we'll put you in this sketch show we've got. And I'd never done anything like that, no experience at all. But I'd been working for seven years, five nights a week in entertainment. So it's not as if I had I was just done after and, and I take it, and I think your karaoke hosting skills had changed a bit and it evolved since ah, it your was early days. It was slightly more than gives a big hand for Jean. Uh, in fact, I'm making a documentary for BBC Scotland uh, just shortly about comedy and woke culture. So that's going to be interesting. But I've got footage in my old karaoke's, so they're uh, on video. So at the moment, they're ripping them and like ripping the videos and put, uh, going to send me to them. I haven't seen them for years uh, and put bits of the karaoke on. So you'll see it be on, be on the telly at some point. As if, are you so finished? I, are you finished about that? Have you finished the documentary? Is it done? No, no. I'm just in pre pre uh, pre production. The new, so I'm gathering all, all the gathering step start filming next week, week after. Run about that filming on and after about a month. Run about Glasgow. I'm going a bit bonkers. We've got uh, Francis says that she saw you at Bonkers and Delmonica's. Did she? And uh, me a photo of Francis. I need to know. I need to know who Francis is. Or our old GM used to be the manager in Bonkers and full on a genuine force of nature. Right. Might not. Might, I, might went, not. I went to Bonkers. I only went to it once or twice uh, when it was. I was just. Uh, we would go for a, a pint at lunchtime, and it was. It was still. It was. It was mental, man. Friday afternoon. Well, uh, that was, but, I was to karaoke on Friday afternoons, and it was absolutely. I'd never seen anything like it. I don't know if Glasgow had, but that idea was taken for the bar and air. Bonkers, that was the original one, and the two owners of that had been to, I don't know, it was somewhere in Florida, they saw this idea of a show bar. It was basically the staff getting up on the stage and singing songs and doing daft turns and that. And then uh, Stachis, I think this is right, bought the idea and bought the name Bonkers and turned it into the one in Glasgow. And I started off of here. All so, the best stuff just comes from air. Ayrshire, anyway. Shouts to Ayrshire. Like, Ayrshire gets a bad rep. But there's some good yeah. stuff there. Ify. Who gives it such a bad rep? I've never heard that in my life. Pass it is, well, uh, <laughs> Glasgow, if you're outside, if you're if you're from anywhere outside Glasgow, you're a chukter, aren't you? Even Aye, if you're, even if you're from Paisley, you're a chukter. Aye, I got quite a bit of that when I moved up here. I moved here when I was 21, although I was born in Glasgow, but I was brought up in here and I moved here when I was 21 and I was still using like Ayrshire speak like words like Ken and stuff like that. So I don't know how often I was like, Ken, who's Ken? So that, Ken Barlow, Ken Barlow, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Batters it out you quite quickly. Wait, so so go ahead, let's, go ahead, let's talk about the woke culture thing because I'm, I'm really interested to hear your your opinion on it all because oh, really? it's, it's a really it's a it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because like on on one hand you've got uh, just I think people's definitions of woke is so all over the place right now. We you know what it means to be woke. And also, like a lot of other people are now telling people to wake up that are maybe on the right wing as well. So it's like there's a what woke means is means different to everyone else. And also cancel culture as well oh. seems a bit of a confusing one because a lot of people are saying that they've been cancelled, but yet they've got platforms to millions of people and they're selling out world tours and stuff. So that's not really being cancelled, is it? Well, I it's a good a good few questions in there, so where I start, I had the idea for the documentary for my own confusion. So I've been out gay for I was 19, so 50 minus 19, blah, blah, blah. That's a long time. Um, thanks, Matt. What age are you? Quick math, quick math. What age are you? Just a mid-30s, just a wee bit older. So I was like, ah, were you born? When I was no, out, you're gay. You're I'm, being, yeah, I'm you're, a lesbian. Were you, uh, I'm not you've even been here. No, nah, yeah, you, you were, you were, you've been gay longer than I've been alive. I, I write, Mark. Right, I get the joke. <laughs> Sitting right here and listening. Um, so, uh, aye. So you would get named it, and working in the scene in Glasgow, you'd get named to me a PC, politically correct than me, do you know? Um, with, with being in Glasgow as well. But, but big teams of lesbians fighting in the pub, like Rangers and Celtic, and I'm in the middle of it all going, stop, stop, let's not fight with each other, and all that kind of stuff. And so anyway... Trying to be aware of that, um, uh, what was uh, 
it's a better way to put it than, than PC. Being decent, right, if that's the way to put it, and trying not to be prejudiced because there's enough prejudice against me but being gay. And then uh, the, the way things are right now, I was especially, I was working with a group of LGBTQI+, and I was getting dead confused, and I was, I was a and I say I was offending folk, but I wasn't I wasn't necessarily offending them, but I was making a lot of mistakes that were really confusing me. I was using wrong terminology and I didn't understand what I was doing wrong because it certainly wasn't intentional. Um, and that's what made me want to examine it, Mia. Um, and I'm doing it through comedy, but my own personal thing is that I'm much wider reach than that, about how it seems to be at the moment we're breaking off and a war in fractions. Factions. I know it's factions, but I like to say fractions because I don't know. I think that makes well, it's sense. Well, it's divisions, isn't it? It's divisions. It makes sense. Thank you. Anyway, factions, fractions, friction, factory. Um, so we've got to have a look at it through the kind of lens of comedy. What's that, what's allowed to say, what you're not allowed to say. We've got to look at all chewing the fat stuff and Camden Bar show stuff to see if it would sort of stand the test of time. Do you know, one of the things we're talking about, and wait for it, I'm, I'm not being ironic or anything, as I take a joy in this, hold on, for dramatic effect, um, is we, we wouldn't be allowed to make the smokers. Remember the smokers and chewing the fat? Yep. That had, um, it, you just wouldn't be able to do that now but, but, because it uh, discriminated against disabilities. And I'm not saying that it's no, it's just that's something that we, it wouldn't have been so prevalent uh, 20 years ago. So it's looking at that, and through the eyes of like your average punter in Scotland as well, what they think about it, to also to teach me, I'm going to meet up with different people so that they can tell me what their, the, the right terminology for different things is. And kind of ask the question about, are we losing, we're busting the arse out of comedy by trying not to offend anybody whatsoever. And, uh, and we're ending up saying, I went to the shops today. And the punchline is, I got breed. Because it's all you're allowed to say anymore. Do you know what I mean? So it's that, that kind of stuff. How I mean, much do you think of chewing the fat would, would if, well, if you were to do it today, how much of it would get through the censors? Well, a lot, quite a lot because um, a lot of it, partly a lot of it was of its time, obviously. But um, when you think about it, a lot of it was near the knuckle, but it was. It was mostly poking fun at Scotland as opposed to particular like minorities in Scotland or minorities in general, anything like that. Um, I mean, and I'm putting this out there, so I'm up for the feedback here, but be gentle. Do you know what I mean? It's not, don't be nasty. But even things like the Banter Boys, I don't know if you remember like Ford and Greg doing the Banter Boys, which were the, the two gay guys. Like, we're only here for the banter. Do you know all that? It, I think if people were to take offence to that the day, it would be a stretch. I'm open to that because whatever offence folk, offence folk, but it's trying to figure out where you draw the line between saying, right, I don't want to upset MD, so I'll take that out. But also, you know, if me, if my joke was I went to the shop and I got some bread and somebody's like, excuse me, um, I'm a baker and I don't like the way you have put that across about the bread, I'm like, I'm like, look, well, I'm gluten free. I'm gluten free, and I can't have bread, <laughs> so that's offensive to me. No, well, I suppose. I suppose what you're talking about. The, if we're talking about specifics, so my feedback to the the banter boys was that I never even know he got that is um, in any way homophobic. Obviously, um, as a straight guy, I don't know really get to make that call. But to me, it just seemed like over the top characters, you know. And, and it was like just that kind of sort of weird the Glasgow banter. You know, you do get those kind of people that exist. So I think that one would, would survive, in my opinion, but once again, I suppose I, I've been more, I'm more aware of these days, just because I don't find something offensive doesn't mean it's offensive to other people, you know. I've got right. Just because people find it offensive doesn't mean that you need to stop doing it, and that is no having license to be cruel either, yeah. um, or bigoted. I mean, there's a really interesting discussion about the difference. You know, Bernard Manning, don't know if you know him, yeah. You heard it in the old 70s comedian, you know, um, and the fact that, you know, he he was outwardly racist, homophobic, misogynist, and admittedly so, you know, it wasn't just his jokes. He he hated uh, the people that he was talking about, the minorities that he was talking about. So where do you get, but can you take a Bernard Manning joke and put it into the mouth of somebody that, I don't know, loves minorities? Can they still say that joke? 
I'm, I have no opinion on that. I don't I think it's each individual case, but I want to explore that and I want to hear what the people of Scotland have to say about that as well. So if there's anybody that's interested in that, um, I don't actually know how to get in touch with folks because I'm not giving you my email address. You don't want my email address. Do you know why? Because I will reply to you. And then you'll be like, ah, oh, fuck, it's Camden Bar again. Jim, I don't know what to do with this. Can I block her? How do I block her? So I'll have a think about that, about how... Uh, how folk can get in touch because I want to hear for the public in Scotland. Yeah, well, I think that it's maybe the, go, what you're saying about the taking a better man a joke and someone else saying it. I suppose it does. It is completely different though. So it's like if you were to make a joke coming from like the uh, like from a, from an LGBT background and you were to make a joke about something involving that, then that would be fine as far as I'm concerned. But it would sound like maybe punching down if it was coming from Bernard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So I think I suppose that's the concern. Sort of and I suppose that the thing that about c- comedians like that is it's the reaction that the jokes get. A lot of it's got this kind of weird round of applause that doesn't seem right. Do you know? It's more like you right. tell them rather than uh, being someone laughing at a, a, a well a, a well worded joke. Because I don't believe in cool. censorship. We should be allowed to make jokes, and it's up to me whether I want to buy your DVD or I don't think anyone buys DVD. I don't buy DVDs, but. It's up to me whether I pay for a ticket to your show because I just think, oh, you sound like an arsehole and I'm sure that your your uh, your audience is going to be full of arseholes kind of applauding a joke rather than laughing at it. Yep. Um, and that, funny, I read something about that recently and it was uh, it was talking about specific types of comedians that were that were new, almost um, cultural spokespeople and instead of getting laughs, they were looking for rounds of applause. Exactly what you said. They're not wanting big laughs at the end. They're wanting folk to go, you're right, you're right. Although they're putting up across their point in the form of a joke, they're no looking for Billy Connolly laughs at it. Um, they're, they're looking for um, a, a kind of affiliation and agreement in it. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for Billy Connolly laughs. Please believe me. That's what I'm wanting. Because it's, um, it's the dopamine. That's what I'm interested in. Dopamine. gives a hit. And for me, that would much more come through laughs. So that's what that documentary is about. Hopefully that's going to be out towards the end of the year by the time we make it and put it all together. Um, but I, I'll just come back with the, the hip-hop stuff and what you're talking about hang there. Um, so Mark and I were on a panel talking about the, uh, no, you correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but the the effects of uh, hip-hop and teaching hip-hop and using hip-hop um, for mental health. And that's the kind of gist of it. Is that right, Mark? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Right. And, I mean, that was only the, the other week we recorded it. So as Mark says, it's gone out on the 31st of July. It blew me away. Uh, um, that hour we spent talking about it because I know what my experiences are but I've only just come into this in the last well what is it, September so it's not even a year that I'm, and, and I can see um, the effects that it's having but of course this has all been going on long before I, I came on the hip hop scene um, and it's blown me away that the implementation of these kind of workshops in places like prisons um, and we in the community the, the wider community uh, and what the potential for it is. I think we're only scratching the surface, and I think because of the pandemic, the way things have been going, there's going to be an, a huge wave of that, which I'm, without sounding again too arty-farty or in, but I'm dead excited about. No, bec- not just because I can get involved, but because of the strength of the effects that it's having, the positive effects that it's having. The, absolutely. I th- I'll put a link in the comments for anyone who's wanting to check out the panel discussion. But it was great. Lots of lots of different people with different of opinions and just but, but a similar experience in how hip hop's helped them. And, you know, we're talking about the, the fact that you can just pick up a pen and write your feelings down and make it rhyme. It's amazing yeah. for me. That's why I write. It's very therapeutic. And then when you write something you think is quite good, you're like, I might as well record it. And then once you've recorded something, you might as well perform it live. But as it's a hip hop scene in Scotland's um, just growing and growing, and you know, we I played a a little show at Glasgow Green last week, and it was I was just a sort of last minute addition, and it was seven people in the cipher, and it was 50 50 gender split. Oh, that does that work? Sorry, four three four three it was. But it just shows you that everybody is changing. People from all backgrounds are getting involved in hip hop, and it is very therapeutic. And it just and what you said is that you can write something really serious and get something off your shoulders, or you can just write something daft. And, you know, that's when when I started writing, or what, 
it was quite dark stuff I was writing, probably because it was therapeutic stuff. But when I started showing it to my friends or releasing anything, I was definitely hiding behind the comedy idea of it was funny songs I was releasing because I was like, if everyone says it's shit, I could just say it. I was only joking. It was a wee joke. And right. uh, then obviously the more I did it, then I started putting in a bit more sort of a bit more realness to it as well. Mm-hmm. And what, what kind of stuff? What, what, if, now that you, I take it you're assume you're getting involved in the writing process yourself. Aye. It, are you are you are you using your, your comedy skills to make it funny, or are you trying to do some some sort of more sort of uh, more serious stuff as well? Well, funny you're saying that. Hold on, I say I'm trying to send you this song, um, like that I did we, I did it with a group for the Citizens Theatre, uh, no theatricals or anything, but the Citizens Community stuff. But when you're saying that, the the idea for the hip hop stuff as well, Mark was, um, I had written a couple of comedy. Um, raps. So one of them was a, a, a what you call it, a rap off. We were just calling it a rap off uh, between Nicholas Sturgeon, Kezia Dugdale, um, Mary Black, and Ruth. Um, and so they were having a rap off each other. And it was a, a group called What's a Face, a women's comedy group called What's a Face. Was working with. Um, and f- so it's st- like you. It started off as comedy, and. I was not intentionally thinking, well, nobody's going to take me seriously, but they know me for comedy, so I'll just do it like that. It was just, I've got this idea. Um, I'd been watching Empire, um, the uh, about the like music scene and the hip-hop and everything, and that's where the idea for that came from. But when I came into doing the workshops, I was starting to write my own stuff, and I was de- doing my own raps. And I, see, there was a big part of my head, like, right, hold the bus a minute. So what I know about hip-hop, again, pardon me, I certainly don't mean this offensively, but the majority of hip-hop that I knew about, I'm talking about global hip-hop at that time, it was predominantly black, male, young, uh, and American rapper. I know, know everybody, but that was the majority of the inf- uh, influences that I had. Um, and I'm like, uh, so you're just about everything that's the opposite of that, and straight, heterosexual as well. So I'm like, you're old, white, gay, woman Scottish want to do hip hop and my head's like that, you can't do this and but the fortunately there was another bit of my head's like that, get to fuck to, the, to that voice in my head I'm doing it anyway and it was like that, you can't you'll like you'll be a laughing stock and I was like that, good uh, I like your laugh <laughs> so, do you know I pushed through that I'm no I'm no in a place and I haven't got any ideas to release stuff of that but I'm not saying that I wouldn't either. And I think a bigger part of it isn't just for marketing and enjoyment and creativity, but it's to challenge the preconceived ideas about who owns, you know, who owns, because I understand where hip hop roots come from, but who can use hip hop? Who who can access it? And my answer to that is everybody. It's got to be everybody. Um, and, and there'll always be respect and reverence for the roots of hip-hop and where it comes from that I know slightly more about now being in this for the last 10 months or so. But that doesn't mean that, you know, um, people like myself, um, so, uh, uh, my, minorities or demographics like myself, can he use it and can he do it? And that's something that I'd like to look more into is uh, like older women um, doing hip-hop. I'm really interested in how that would come about. And is it, is it, I, I, is it, it, I haven't actually managed to get into that yet. What's the kind of demographic of the workshops you've been doing? Everything. Uh, the one I was going to send you there, which I will, they were on early 20s. I worked with, um, I actually went out and worked at the Good Shepherd um, Secure Unit. Um, and that was some of the uh, students there were uh, as young as 11. So 11 to 17 is their age group. Um, the oldest ones in some of the groups have been in their seventies, um, so I must have worked with over a dozen groups now. Um, refugees, uh, so nay, you know, these are people that have came to Glasgow, um, obviously for for asylum, um, and uh, like people with special needs in the community as well. Um, I've just finished doing a fantastic group, with a, a group of vulnerable women as well, uh, uh, working in a writers group and. Uh, the woman that ran it approached me and says, well, they're, they're doing writing and poetry anyway. I was like, ah, that's there you are. All we need to do is put a beat behind that now and just shorten it into eight bars for each of them. And I'm taking them through how to structure that as well. Well, that's the interesting thing is that Scotland's got a, a long history of poets, comedians, 
actors, stuff like that. But it seems to be quite weird that if you put a banger of a beat behind those people, start so, getting like, what? Oh no, it's it's changed a lot though. It's changed a lot though. Even in, I mean, I've been I've been sort of involved in the music scene in the hip hop scene for about maybe 12, 13 years, and you? it was like. By the way, your album is magic. I had to listen to it. Thanks for sending me it. I really, I, I, I didn't know your work at all. It was great to listen to it. So thanks. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad. Jackal Trades at this point is out now, by the way. If it, a wee plug for myself. But nice. Not, but, yeah, but yeah, I started I started writing hip hop like from a very young age, but I think I heard Loki's album, <laughs> Friendly World. Nice. And it was so, it was, he was about the same age as me, but it was, it was so far advanced and production and words that I just sort of took a back I just took a back seat because at that point this is before people had proper internet I'd, I thought I'd invented Scottish hip hop but it, I turned out I was very very wrong and uh, so I, I, I took a back seat but then I started being in a band called well I started a band called Gyro Babies which was more kind of started off a bit comic and then it got a bit more serious as we got into it and that was kind of more more kind of rock music punk music but it was still written to, to a hip hop rhythm to it but I was getting away with as much rapping as I could without before my guitarist noticing. Occasionally he would pull me back and go, that's getting a bit, it's getting a bit rap. It's just a bit, a bit like rap music, Mark. Told, put, reel it in. So Jack Trace for me has been really good just to kind of not worry about all that, just get out. And all the young people coming up now, they don't have the Scottish cringe in the same way. I don't know if the referendum changed that as well, but it was a definite Scottish cringe uh, for anyone doing it. And now it seems like the young people can relate to that more. Than a lot of the other Scottish, Scotland's more traditional things. In fact, I've actually got a comment from uh, the amazing Sweet Rogue, uh, who's saying, who's saying, timeless in my opinion, pure raw, raw characters and just out and out Scottish banter. She also commented saying that she wants a, 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 a feature from you. A feature, she wants you to rap on her. Sweet Rogue's an amazing young female uh, Scottish hip hop artist. Oh, magic. So, so you should definitely check her. I agree. Love to hear that. At- I don't know enough about the Scottish hip hop scene yet, and that's where that's where I'm going next. Once I'm done with this documentary, I, I really want to investigate that mayor and totally infiltrate it. Do you know what I mean? Get my feet yep. right under the under the chair, under the well, chair. I, I invent, well, lesson one: I invented it. Uh, good. I, I didn't. I didn't really. I was it started in the eighties. But uh, lots of comments coming in. Uh, Becky Wallace saying, Tune the Fat was brilliant. Shows that Little Britain, the two racist grannies making fun of disabled folk. That's offensive. Tune the Fat always centered around Scottish yeah, humour. Oh boy, Becky, I, buzz. I would agree with that, right? Um, True Creation says, Your partner is bra. Love your energy and all the puzzle pieces and references to real folk that make up your many characters. Cool, thank you. Hunter Ray, Tune the Fat has aged better than the English sketch shows that Little Britain, uh, another uh, good. Good comparison. This is fantastic. Just enjoyed watching rerun of the Karen Dunbar show. All the characters are fab and love Tom Yuri too. But we had Tom in the show. Aye, well. that's right. Aye. So uh, to- oh, that's a bit of a name drop for me. That was a bit of a name drop. Hold on. Yeah. Name drop. You call that radio. A name drop for Tom Yuri, but he is a total legend, and it was it was great to get him in the show with a with a brilliant chat, really nice guy. Recently, it's like, who does Meryl Streep name drop? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Meryl, it's just like I, I met, uh, and who does she say? Because nobody's going to be more impressed because it's Meryl Streep that's telling them. <laughs> like, I, I met Tom Cruise, but like, I know, but you're Meryl. Streep. <laughs> yeah. you know I, mean? I met the Pope. I like, don't really care, it's Meryl. It's you, anyway. <laughs> Have you got a name drop for us? What's your biggest name drop? I fucking Meryl Streep. <laughs> did you meet Meryl? Did you meet Meryl? Uh, what's, what's the I story with that? I think about her often. Uh, I am in New York. She came to see the play I was in. <laughs> hey! Oh! Give that name drop thing again. That is no Meryl Streep name drop. That's the biggest name drop I've had. Name you. drop. I've affronted myself there because I try not to do it, but um, Meryl Streep, I, Meryl I, was Streep I was actually, I was, I was slavering. I don't mean that in a like poncy way you're in, but I was just like, ah, can I believe that's Meryl Streep? I was on stage, I'm like, ah, Meryl Streep's watching me, Meryl Streep's in the audience watching me. And then taking bit, notes, taking notes. And then about me, he's like, ah, can you need to say words soon because you're in this play of mind and you've got to say things. And I was like, oh, I, but anyway. I? That was, I actually want to ask you about that. Uh, the, the, so obviously for your acting and you're doing um, theatre and stuff. So I've done a tiny bit of acting, nothing major, just tiny little, usually small scenes or whatever. But 
obviously I think people say a lot when you're doing live music or hip hop or spoken word, which I've done, there's quite a lot of words to remember. People are like, how do you remember, you know, how do you remember all those words? But for me, it's quite easy because there's a there's a rhyming structure to it. So it's like, obviously, it's just practice. You just got to do it over and over again. There's there's no secret art that way. But if you just do it over and over again, listen to it over and over again, it kind of stays in your head. But I've always wondered for like sort of longer form stuff that doesn't rhyme, like it plays or or um, scenes. I mean, what's, uh, right. have you got a, a, a method to that? No. no. <laughs> well, that's not true. I mean, some folk, like, real, I'm saying real actors, and I'm not doing myself doing, but I've no training or anything like that. I kind of fell into it and, and did no bad. So I did no bad. Fucking listen to me. I'm like, I met Meryl Streep. Yeah, I've done yeah. not bad. <laughs> anyway, anyway. So, so, so there's that Scottish cringe thing again. Like, I've done no bad. I'm all right. Um, repetition for me. A lot of, like, actors have got method and that. They'll be like, well, I try and harness uh, the words to an emotion. I'm like that. No, I just say it hour and hour and hour again. Um, so repetition is a big part of it, though. And there was one of the things I did was a monologue uh, written by Denise Miner, the Scottish crime writer. Um, it was brilliant, by the way. It's no, you can't see it. We never recorded it, uh, but it was on or in morning. It was on at the festival, Edinburgh Festival. And you'll see it on our website. It's called A Drunk Woman Looks at the Thistle. It's some piece of writing. And it's the longest thing I'd ever did at that point. I've done longer than that now. Man. I think I've seen that. Did you do a did you do a part of it at, on was it on the Scotsman or something? Am mm. I getting it wrong? You, is it Scott is Scottish in it? It's in Scots. Well, oh, I think uh, Tamashanta. Don't think no, I don't think it's Tamashanta. No. Um, no, drunk, drunk woman looks at a thistle. I no, it's not in Scot. I mean, there's no any more Scots than I'm talking to now, so, which is Scots, I suppose, but but um I remember at the time, I mean, at the time I was printing it off and it was just like page after page after page was coming out. And I was like, ah, I'll never be able to do it. It was 45 pages because 45 minutes, a minute a page. And I was like, ah, I'll never remember this. But it rhymed and that was that was the way to try. And, so it's just like that. What I'd say to myself as well, and I think this was a good thing for learning, especially monologues, was, Right, I'm so host at karaoke, do you know what I mean? So I could sing, I knew the words, all the words to, let's say, 15 songs. So if that's 15 songs, all the words to 15 songs, it's three minutes a song, that's 45 minutes. So I'm like, I know 45 minutes of dialogue. I can do 45 minutes of dialogue. It's just lyrics to a song, they've got a tune to it. So if I can learn that, I can learn 45 minutes of talking. And that changed something in my head, which I think was rather clever. I don't know how that happened, but it came, it came up like that. But repetition's a huge part of it, Mark. So you're just learning a script. You're just going hour it and hour it. Some folk have got photographic memory, and I admire them. And I fucking hate them for it. All the best of them. They've got that. I can't. I've got to sit, and I've got to have somebody, yes, testing me on it all the time, saying, stop, you've got that, Ryan. I'm like, ah, no, it's if, no but. So it is. It's drilling it. What about going back to karaoke? What, when you're a... Uh... I take it that you would, did you just have your your favourite songs that you would do and then did you re learn them so much that you wouldn't have to look at the screen? Aye, but I, I mean, I have got, I've got a very retentive memory or a HUD. I'm 50, you know, so it's on its way out. But, uh, in fact, I was a wee hang, I was dating some of the rap workshops and my dame with Carol Lawler, Scottish singer, songwriter, fucking magic woman. So she was doing a lot of uh, acoustic music with, uh, and I'm doing the rap underneath it. So Carol, uh, we're talking about some. This was on a, a rap workshop, and Carol says, "You're like something about the housewife's tale, right? The housewife's tale." And I was like, ah, "Carol, what do you mean the housewife's tale?" I says, "Do you mean uh, the handwife's tale?" So I'm pissing myself laughing at her, and she's like, "Oh, is it?" And then one of the other lasses went, uh, "Excuse me, it's the handmaid's tale." So I think I'm correct, and Carol, I'm saying, "Handwife, who's a fucking handwife? Hand <laughs> it's the handwife's tale," and I'm like. Ah. My mother lives on, do you know what I mean? Con at the hand. I'm slagging her for getting it rang by getting it rang. Anyway, that's a memory thing. So aye, it's it's learning it like that. Um Donna be. says that she name dropped you to my boss when you said you were coming tomorrow. Good to, oh, good on you, Donna. Tell your boss I expect her. Her. So as a lady boss, it's a bit like there and all oh, like uh, dripping in enthusiasm. Uh, Danny says we'd recommend Cam to watch Sweet Rogue at Capture Works. Yeah, I'd recommend that as well. What's Sweet that? Rogue. So Sweet Rogue, who's wants you to feature on a on a song, she's she did a live set for us. So if you go on our YouTube channel, we do a lot of live sessions where we do live streams from Cracking okay. Me Venue 
called Capture Works, which is not even a real venue. It's a, it's a live stream venue, but they turned their warehouse into well, the technology to actually make good quality video and audio in real time. Unlike all these other live streams you see that are not really live, uh, Capture Works could do it, but Sweet Rogue did an amazing job of that. Uh, we've got a comment from one of my favourite comedians is Jim Jeffries. I went to see him a few years ago and the girl beside me sat, shook her head and tutted the whole time while I pushed my seat with laughter. <laughs> um, Mark, I sent you that. See if that's come up in the email, that um, uh, for logic. For, listen to me, I don't even know how it, the terminology like that. See if it's come up in the email for logic. Don't know All right, ho ho holiday. holiday. Aye, aye. Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll just what we'll do is I'm just going to I'm going to upload that to to, for, to work out what with the Dropbox. So what we're just talking about, because like, someone else said, uh, comedians like Dave Chappelle and Sarah Silverman, some of my favourites outside the Scottish comics, and I reckon they're seen as offensive. Yeah, but I think that two great examples there, uh, Dave Chappelle and Sarah Silverman, are hilarious, and they do approach uh, you know taboo subjects, but they do it in a very clever way. And that's the thing. At the end of the day, if something's funny, it is funny. It's just, is there a bit of intelligence? Does it went? Has there been a bit of thought behind it? And yeah, what, what can? While I'm just uploading this, what kind of comedians uh, do, do you do you like actually? What, who's, who's your favourite comedians? I mean, it's going to sound a bit stereotypical, like the go-to answer, but it's Billy Connolly. That's far and away my biggest influence. Um, was uh, Billy Connolly? See the thing that I've laughed at most recently. It's not so much a stand-up, um, but I pushed myself at it. it. Was the Alan Partridge thing? And like like his new one, the uh, This can't, Life. Uh, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one that's on I play now. I think it's this life. So it's like a kind of piss take like a the one show basically. Aye, aye. Uh, aye it's, it's brilliant. It's not called this wife. I think it's called the um the handwife's tale. Anyway, <laughs> um but his characterization, so I really enjoy characterization like that, but I mean, even some of the stuff that Frankie Boyle's done in that, if we're talking about controversial, and I know there's levels, I think there's levels, and he speaks very highly of me, but there's levels of Frankie and like that, too far, but there's some of the other stuff I'm like that. It's that gasp, gasp where they laugh. And there's other things I'm like, that's just no funny. It's just an approach, a, a, no an approachable subject. I think there are some things, you know, um, like real trauma-based stuff that uh, there's, there's no real way to do that, I don't think. I think it's too too serious and there's too his much. New, his, his new show that's on iPlayer, I think it's recorded in 2019 at the King's Theatre, maybe. Right. But I watched that the other night and it was brilliant because that was the first time that Frankie Boyle's kind of stepped out of his stand up persona and maybe talked a bit about the controversy that surrounded some of his jokes. And I thought that was quite a brave thing to do as well because obviously there have been a few of his fans that have came along going, shit, Frankie Boyle's woke. Uh, oh, if, you read, if, you read, if you read these Guardian, you know, he writes articles for the Guardian and stuff. He makes some amazing points um, politically and stuff like that. And then I think a lot of his jokes are intended to be like it's from the point of this is what something that the Daily Mail might say and stuff like that. But it's obviously does does go over a lot of people's heads. Oh. And, and same for me, like I, I hear something, I go, "Fuck sake, Frank! Frank! Fuck sake, Frank! How can you justify that as a joke?" And then I think that the, the new show is definitely worth worth watching because he seems to kind of comment on it almost in like a Stuart Lee kind of way where he's aye, aye. the comedian within the comedian so I really enjoyed that there's a really interesting uh, show on Netflix and it's by Hannah Gadsby called Nanette so I don't know if any of you have seen that but there's some strong stuff in that and in that she talks about being sexually abused as a child so you're like ah, wait a minute sexually abused a child stand up no having it but she's talking about her experience and she's talking about how comedy's made out of know that particularly, but out of stuff like that, it's a fucking piece of work. As social commentary, it's my her, her stand up's great, but how she turns that about, it's worth a watch. And it's it's hard going, but it's that's why it's so powerful, is because it's so deep. Um, but I suppose that's a bit of a different thing because I'm not saying that she makes comedy out of that this time. Thank you. What would we call it? This time, this life, I call it this the hand, this the hand life. life times, the hand <laughs> life times, or something like that. <laughs> so, Hannah Gadsby, that's interesting. I think that's an interesting, like, social comment on stand up and comedy and humor and how it's used and how it's abused as well. I mean, yeah. and I think I've got ready now the track. I think we can play the track. I go and so I, I did all the music. You want to give us a wee introduction to it? What, what, what can we expect here? 
uh, was working with a group of 20 somethings um, who just come through the citizens, a uh, sort of community collective, uh, wanted to do some stuff, wrote a seismic economy as we're talking about the pandemic, um, put their ideas down, wrote it and it gave them eight bars each, you know, and uh, one of them, if you take, well, I, I don't know if you're going to, ah, you play it all, I think you've got time. Um, uh, the challenge for me, try to speed it up and everything, because as much as I'm on logic, I'm still very in the early stages of it. By the way, if anybody's wanting to give me free logic lessons, I'll pay you. That doesn't make sense. But anyway, I'd like that. So if you get any recommendations for logic pro lessons, I'd be very happy to hear them. Um, but I, so this is this is the outcome. So go for it. Okay, let's do it. Holiday. All right. I believe. So hold on. That should be it. Let me know if you can hear this okay, and then I'll take our our faces off the screen because I've got resting bitch face, as you know, right. when when I'm not seeing it. So wait, is it? Let me know if the sounds okay. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it okay, Karen. Cool. All right, guys, we'll be back in a little minute. Where's in the comments? What you think of this? Yes, yes, we be vibing. All our enemies be crying. Truly, truly, they be dying. Step on a scene, thunder and lightning. Truly, truly, we be vibing. On the dance floor, we be flying. That sweet one be smiling. Oh, look at me, now she's spying. Yes, yes, we be flirting. Yes, yes. He be vibing. There he's there. I see him standing there. Go to the bar and face my fear. I'm walking now, walking back to my past. Maybe this guy was to ever last. I've been pulled back. My life saviour. What was he thinking? That shock behaviour. He's a howler. I need to calm down. Passes that drink. I yellowish brown. I apply. I grew. I dress as I may. I exit, I strut, I know I slay. My prey eye me up as if I'm the victim. Little do they know, I manipulate the system. I walk down the stairs, late as fuck. I see the customers already trying their luck. I'll dominate them, show them the way. Oh, you poor boy, does your bank card need Chasing midnight beetles, showing over sticky tables through indoor fog with my pals from the bog for a pint so high that the mouth spills over. You're a real Irish pub if I'm a poor leaf over. Tan of venom down a shot, dance the sweat off if it's hot. It's a good time, a long time cider vodka, bucky white. Bartender alchemist, he's a potion, get his pissed. If you want a proper laugh, come out of your fucking gas. Yeah. Hold on, my head's pounding, so I'm going outside. You get another round in, it's freezing out there, and I'm a drunk wreck. But to be honest, it's nice to get a rest. The well, Sassy walks up in a course, we start chatting. Why the back comb my hair? I'm not ready to feel it matting. I finished my smoke, my new best pal's the studio. Wait, is that Madonna playing? Here we fucking go! Club and I feel so lit up. Please don't stop. Keep on moving, put your drinks up. Everything to fix day. It's time to get the best up. Some people just need to shut the hell up. It's about time I start to get up on the dance floor so that I can shake my head and ask some more. Just come on, Mr. DJ, please give me some more so that I can move on the big massive dance floor. This club is packed, but I'm all alone. Drunk as fuck, but I'm in my zone. Hey, you expect me to dance? 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 Hey, you Trying to save up money that won't go far. Yeah, this work is harsh and it's leaving scars. Hoping one day I'm gonna be a big star. Bartender, bartender, behind the boozer. Why doesn't this gin have an infuser tea bag in it? That's the worst. Oh god, I'm so drunk I can barely. Oh, that's absurd. I'm sure he didn't mean it. Just sick down your top. Maybe ask this nice man if he has a mop. High heels, wet floors, spilling drinks, music roars, dance until it stops, reality hits. Where's the chip shop? Do you want weird or do you want it to do? If you don't really
amazing stuff. Hold on. I need to get the thing. Okay, I was last week, not 40. I need to get your face out of the way so that I can see your face. That was brilliant. Amazing. So good. Uh, lot, lots of amazing, nice comments coming in. Aye, thanks for the comments. It's, it's a real buzz, actually, to hear that, because it's only with that wee group that none of them have rapped before. You know, they, well, the first guy had, but none of them have done that before. I mean, I'm cobbling stuff together, and I I can hear the flaws, and I know that I'm doing it done because we did a great job with it, but it's good to get some feedback. My, my hope would be to really start some kit like producing it for them uh, and getting them into a studio, but fucking lockdown, blah, blah. But it's opening up what you say, Mark. It is, it's, uh, it's some, I, love the, I love the fact that you're saying that there's people in there that haven't rapped before, but yet so they've, some, uh, one of the girls there was rhymed, rhymed head pounding, I think, we get around in. Right. And that's, that's just, that's class. Like, I just listen to people rapping all the time and I've not heard anyone rhyme round in me pounding yet. So <laughs> fucking superb. And I think we spoke about that a little bit in the panel, which, like I said, I put the comments in the link so people can check out the full panel conversation on the 31st of July for Hang. It's, uh, but what, one of the, the things that we did talk about is there's just a directness that uh, someone who's never written before, like there might be people watching this right now, they want to write, but they think, oh, I won't be any good. But when you just write and you don't think about it too much, you can create some amazing stuff that that maybe a more seasoned writer would, would bite your arm off, bite their arm off for it, bite right. someone's arm off for it. Listen, I'll put this out as well. It's not as a plug, but it's merely a beg. But I'm looking, I'm I'm looking to um start some kind of wait for it. I don't really know how I'm putting this through. So anybody can give me feedback, including yourself, be happy. It's some therapeutic DJing work. I had DJed for seven years and I've just got into it um on on a program on my Mac. I'm doing it like about an hour every night, and it's uh, I can't even begin to tell you the fucking joy that I'm getting out of it. So I'm looking, I want to start doing some workshops with that with folk that want to DJ as well and teaching them because I've got the rudiments of it, even though I've not got it so much. Um, the transferring, because I used to work with, like, I was a mixing DJ. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. My point is, I'm looking to DJ and I'm looking to DJ for free for folk that are on as well um, to, get my, to get myself back into it. So I'm just putting that out there. So any ideas about that? Because I'm thinking, if I'm getting so much out of DJ and then other folk will as well and be able to teach them that um, and do workshops with that too, I'm only sticking my tea in the water at how much can be done for mental health and well-being through creativity because mine's has always been for commercial reasons uh, and now moving into this, this is so much more, it really is so much more rewarding. And that sounds like one of the kind of PR things that you would say but anybody that works in this, including yourself, Mark, and, and does this kind of stuff, I know Becky's in it, um, will be able to know that. They'll know that. They'll be like, absolutely. So it's all about me. I want the, I want the dopamine. I want I'll the break dopamine. You. I'll book you. I'll book you for an underground That's gig smart. Or, a, or a rave. When it's I'm in. I'm on it. For a rave. I, I'll send you one of my, I'll send you one of my sets, which some of the what can, what can I, what can I, what can I, I heard, I was listening to you in another podcast other, earlier today and you were saying that it's, it's a bit of everything that you play and stuff, but have you got a particular um, um, genre you like to go for? It'll be dance music for the 90s to new. That's so it's exactly 30, 30, I mean, I've got, I've got about 25,000 songs on my iTunes. I'm totally obsessed with music. So I actually meant that music was my first love and it will be my last so, but what this is doing for me during this time, and I'm shared for other folk, um, it's, it's totally opened my mind back up to um, the potential that there is in music and my love for it and my enjoyment of it. Um, it's so much, it's so much less stress than being in the sort of theatre and acting and comedy circuit. It's not actually about the things, though. It's about the commercialisation of it, and I'm trying to come away from that. I don't know if, like myself, but most folk have had a, th a thought to themselves, like, what am I fucking doing? What am I doing? Uh, and you, still and get the, you still get the dopamine hit without the oh, pressure uh, as well, uh, don't it? It's like you're getting... There's no the same end, there's no, there's no the same come down as well, which is just, that's the paid up. That's that's the gold. So, so, when you try, so just to go back to what you're saying about therapeutic DJ sets, are you talking about, like... Okay, I know a couple of people who do like therapeutic music for like people with dementia or things like that, or you mean just like a therapeutic, it's just therapeutic for you to mix music and you're up for teaching people like a software or something? That's that's the gist. I don't really know. I only had this idea yesterday. <laughs> hey, <laughs> okay. I mean, but, uh, hey, if I'm enjoying this, 
Other folk will enjoy it. I'll show them how to do it. That'd be good. That's it. That's the plan. Which, 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 software, which software would you recommend? What's your favourite software for mixing? I'm using the, what you call it? I fucking got to look at it, man. DJ Pro. Um, I know, I know there's other ones, but because I started off with DJ Pro, that's where I'm at the new, and I'm having a ball with it. I'm well, that's but. I actually seen a meme the other day saying that it's like people have these um, on the internet have big arguments over what's the best software for mixing or the best software no, for yeah. making music and it's always just so happens to be this, the first one that someone tried, you know what I mean? Right, people right. get quite loyal, they get loyal to their, their software, which is fair enough because I mean I've had to learn a few different softwares over lockdown and I'm hopefully happy with what I've got now, I don't want to be learning new stuff anymore. Um, I've got Gavin Mitchell's in the house, another legend Gavin. here. Hiya, doll. That was smashing. Just tuned in while I'm stirring my stovies. That's <laughs> not a euphemism. Hope to see you soon. Love from me and Bob the dog. Hiya, Gavin. Good to see Gavin. Gavin's been on the show as well. That's another name drop. If anyone wants to check out Gavin that. Mitchell. Um, That's a good name to drop. And I think Gavin's doing some good work with the uh, Stop the Closures stuff as well that everyone should be checking out. I believe the next one is on the 31st of July, so you could stop the closures. I think uh, it's uh, the People's Palace on the 31st of July. Stop oh, really? the closures then. And then you can sign up to the hang thing, which we can sign up for that today, but that'll be a, a bunch of panels, including the one me and Karen done, a bunch of panel shows, and then there's going to be a live event at SWG3. I believe it's it's sitting down. So it's, it's legit, it's allowed, it's legal. Uh, we've got Hunter, G Hunter Ray is up for DJing, Right, Hunter, come out of mine about half nine. I'm going, give me a bit of time to, after I come off this. I'm going to iron my top. Uh, Lou says, I'm going to use stirring my stovies as a euphemism for going for a great white. Uh -huh. We've got Tam the van in the house. Big ups to Tam, legend. We've got GBH is in the house. And Sanjeev says, started producing lockdown, really helped me mentally. Right. I'm surprised to hear that, Sanjeev. Like, he's, his beats are banging I've, I've, from what I've heard on Instagram. So, amazing stuff. Uh, we've got Colette in the house. Hello, Colette. Hello, Richie, who's um, spearheading the, the hang thing oh, with Alana. Richie. Big ups to Richie as well. Um, and yeah, going back to the song uh, itself, love the sample cutting. So real. One word, brilliant. Sounding nice. Nice work. Um, I'm foot dancing, getting up the new quality, says James Solson, who's another fantastic producer based in Bristol, who's actually got a, a tune in the next Jackal Trades record as well. So, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing to hear all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, hopefully an EP or something, do you think? Have you, got, you think you've got enough uh, people that you've been working with to maybe probably put together enough, something? Like? Probably enough for a double album with a gatefold sleeve. <laughs> you know, half the stuff's in my head. So, as you know, it's one thing having your head and it's another thing putting it out there. So that's what I want to move into. I mean, the pros and cons to it is I've been busy with my own stuff, like making the documentary and that. Um, but I really want to get into more of this. So it's been great to talk about it tonight and, and to get some feedback. So thanks to everybody that's been on. And what about, uh, is there any, have, you, have you just kind of sort of taken, a, a, from what, because I think you said the last time I was talking to you that, uh, like having writing theatre and stuff, it just wasn't appealing to you. That's why you kind of moved to that. So you've just been having a, a nice break from that, or you you got have you got a bit I, of at, at the moment, I mean, things are picking up, Mark, but I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly not coming out of the job or anything like that, but um, I'm much, I, I'm connecting much more, at least right now, to the stuff that I'm doing. We're in music, we're in these workshops, um, we're in the community. I don't know, there's it's just. It really is so much more rewarding for me. The new, do you know what I mean? Meryl Street phones later and she's like, I'm going to be in Mamma Mia 17. I want you to play the granny. I'll, be like, I'll need to get back to you. What day is that, Meryl? What day is it? No, I'm not sure. I think I'm in the, I'm in the housewife's tale that day. For fuck's sake, I don't know. Anyway, so I don't know. I don't know. There's a play. I've got a play coming up at Oran Moore as well in the autumn. Um, but other than that, I'm no, don't tell my agent, but I'm no actively out there looking for stuff. You know? Well, it's, I've been kind of with that as well with, 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 with gigs. I mean, I've just agreed to, I think, the first gig, real gig in September, Linda's Farm Festival, which we're crossing okay. our fingers for. But it's just, I, see, I get quite excited about a gig coming up and I put a lot of work into promoting it and that. And I just feel like it'd be, I'd be quite disappointed putting all that time and effort into something that doesn't happen. And also, I've been very lucky with this podcast. So I've filled in a lot of those gaps by being able to do something that I enjoy. 
So it's not been as, you know, I'm just going, well, well, I'll believe a gig when I see it happen. Right. And then I'll start, you know, I do put, I'm an event organiser and I'm a prefer, regular performer. So, but I want to see one with my own eyes before I start getting carried away and booking yeah. stuff. Exactly. That's see, when a- I was sitting down to write, I was like, ah, where's this going on though? And that was the block to it. I couldn't see, I couldn't, uh, and I know you can like just write it and it'll, it'll come, of a, but I couldn't connect it, Mark. Whereas this, I knew it could start. I mean, that's all, that recording the night, that, that's all recorded. That's folk on their phones and on Zoom. So I'm recording it off Zoom and then putting it into Logic. So, to, you know, imagine being able to do that in a studio with folk. It'd be a whole different thing. But it's worked. It's worked to the degree that it had to during lockdown because everybody could do it. So, you did, you know, we adapt. We do what we can. We, we've got But the, the benefits that came for it have blown my mind. And that's how I'm wanting to actively pursue it, Mayor. Amazing. I've got a question, a couple of questions in. Can someone ask me, can you book almost angelic? <laughs> I think they've hung up their spurs, the new uh, Angela and Ricky. But they're, they're out there, they're out there on YouTube. We've got, uh, and who is your favourite character to play? Uh, there's that many of them. Um, I t- there's that many brilliant characters, but. Uh, I think, I mean, all Betty, I really enjoyed doing that. And I did it in still game there with Gavin. Um, and I was playing, all Betty was God. That was, that was a one-off, man. That was, that was something no, else. I was, I was there. I, we, we were there with my dad and that was a, I was a great, I wasn't expecting that one. So it was brilliant. Uh, I knew it was that. Uh, <laughs> was, was that. What was that? What is that? Is that, I mean, that was, that was crazy crowds that you were playing. Uh, yeah, it was 10,000 a night. Wow. 10,000 a gig, some to 10,000 in the afternoon. What are you doing the day? Because I was just talking to 10,000 folk. Um, so and I. 10,000 at night again as well. So 20,000 a day. It's crazy. Yeah, no. And Gavin, Gavin, it's, it's about you drew back on as well because he's he was on the show. We started this day one of lockdown. So I think Gavin was on maybe what, a few weeks into it. So it's time to get Gavin back on. I think he's got some stuff to talk about as well. So uh, Rip Torn saying, mind the stoner sketch. Aye, that was a cracker. <laughs> There's been lots of people ask, keeps on, keep on talking about uh, Giza Swatch, your fanny sketch, which seems uh-huh. to be the, the most uh, yeah. Do people shout out catchphrases at you? I, I own and half, but I mean, certainly know as much as it used to, um, because when chewing the fat was at its height, you know, I couldn't really move for it. I know that that's it's not a bad complaint to have, but I don't know. It's like it's went into the popular culture. I mean, I'd been on holiday, I was away working, it's about five years ago, six years ago, I was working down in London, when I come back, I was got to see my pal, and I was in Park Heath, so I parked the motor, I was walking along, there was two wee boys, eight, six-year-old, and one of them went, excuse me, are you Camden Bar? And I went like that, hi, and I, and I, was, I thought he was going to say, because my mum says or something, and he, was like, and he says to the other wee boy, that's the woman that we watch on YouTube. And that totally blew my mind, do you know what I mean? That's like 12 years after the show is out, do you know? They weren't, they weren't born, anything like it. And um, oh, it was longer than 12 years it was out. So I, it's, it, there was a, I was out cycling there night and I was coming down Sucky Hall Street and there was a guy on his bike in front of me. I think he did a few swallies. He fell off his bike and I stopped him and he had a hat on and headphones and everything. He fell off his bike and he's lying there like, I'm fucking mad. And I went there and I went, are you all right, pal? And he went, are you fucking Camden Bar? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, aye, are you all right? And he's like, fuck's sake, man. Camden, he's lying there, there's a big hole in his elbow. He's like, Camden Bar. And I went, and then somebody else come up and went, you all right, pal? And I thought, I'll leave him to it. And I was like, as long as you're all right, he's like, it's Camden Bar. <laughs> <Glad to know. laughs> I wonder if I wonder if you'll wake up the next day with a hangover and I see an elbow go. I swear to God, uh, calmed on the bar, put me off off a bit off the flare. Um, Probably to lay out. Right, uh, you had too many, the... mate. One too many. What was like? I think you said something during the, the panel show last week. I can't remember. You were kind of joking about. I don't know. You were joking about. But you were you're saying something, and it was like I almost went like ooh, Wait, and oh, not right. even realizing that it was you, not even thinking that right. that. Would, and I stopped myself, you know, because that's just. That's a well. That's one of many phrases that people just use, and I was like, that would have been very unprofessional, shite part to do when you've got one of the characters from that show doing it. But um, so I didn't do it because, like, I think I remember one time, I think somebody, I was at a, I was working in a call center, and at one time Ford walked by, and the guy I was with went, "Gone, ain't no day that." And I think he just said, "Fuck off." 
Right. But you ever seen Lemmy sketch? Um, we are I'm a huge fan of Lemmy. Fucking oh, he's amazing. Love I love him, but is uh, I'll no bother doing the whole sketch because when he do it justice, but it's like that. Can you imagine I worked in an office or something at Bill at S and he's going, Excuse me, mate, can you tell me where the photocopier is? And the guy's like, that. You look like Lemmy. I mean, it's Lemmy doing his sales like that. You look like Lemmy. And he's like, All ah, right, can you tell me where the photocopier is? And he's like, that. Are you Lemmy? He's like, that. Oh, my. And he's like, that. No way, man. Lemmy, what are you doing in here? And Lemmy's like, that. I'm working here now. This is what I do. This is my job. He's like, that. No, are you filming some? No way, man. It's Lemmy. He's like, that. Listen, can you tell me where the photocopier is? I really need to like, that. Ah, say something funny. He's like, that. I need to photocopy this. I was pissing myself like that. That's what happened to me when I'm starting shelves in Tesco's. But, uh, no way, man, what are you doing in here? Are you filming something? Uh, no, I'm attending to the Cocoa Pops. You know, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing yeah. fucking conflicts. Well, well, that's it. You, because when, people, when you're that famous, I suppose, just doing a job like that, you couldn't really interact with the public without people wanting a, a selfie or wanting to tell you their favourite sketch. Aye, but I've got to say, and I'll finish up saying, just magic, Mark, because see, 99.9% .9 of folk that come up to me, they're like, I love you. I loved this. My man loves this. My boy, blah, blah. I remember this. And the, it's 99.9% .9 positivity. Um, I think the worst thing I've had was some saying, my man loves you, but I don't really like you. Do you know, that, that was, <laughs> when I was by my bed, take to my bed for two days. That was hard for me. That was hard. Well, so, 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 why, why is it that, that artists in all disciplines do that, though? You know, they get lots of, it's, it's usually 99% positive comments, and then just one person says, I hate that, and it just so, somehow sticks for some reason. Uh, I, well, I think, I can't speak for anyone. Like, we're sensitive souls. We're sensitive. I think so. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I'll talk for myself. Mm. You know, I, I really struggle with criticism. I do. I wouldn't even dress that up. And I've tried and I've looked at reviews and I've looked at stuff and it never gets any easier. So I just try and note it. I don't always manage, but I try and note it. Because I'm like, ah, it sticks in my head for ages. But I try and note it. If I don't look at that, then I don't look at the positive stuff either. But it's no so bad. It's no, I don't want to hear the positive stuff, but it's no so bad because at the end of the day, I've got to try and um, do what it is that I feel like, you know, make what it is that I feel like making and then hopefully... Um, Folk will enjoy it, but it's not always going to be the case. And what, what, what about social media? Are you, are, you, are you about on social media? Do you bother with that? Well, I've got a Twitter account, but I don't... I mean, this sounds fucking awfully arty farty as well, but I don't operate it because I, get, I get, went doing a Twitter whole way. And I was... See, when I started Twitter, I just followed everybody that was following me. So I think I'm following... I think I've got 20,000 followers and I'm following 19,000 folk or something like that. So I just followed them all back. Folk were um, tweeting me like Margaret for uh, Bears Den and everything, saying, really love the show. And I'm like, ah, thanks very much, Margaret. I hope all's well with you. And then I was getting mere and mere. I was replying like texts. Do you know what I mean? So I, I couldn't sustain it. So I just let somebody else post. So somebody else tweet at the stuff. Uh, I send the stuff to them and they, they tweet it out. But I don't make any comments on it or that because like, I don't know. Who wants to hear my opinion? Do you know what I mean? I certainly don't want to that. I've loved hearing your opinions tonight. Karen Dunbar, absolute legend. Thanks for joining us tonight. I've put the website in, which is, as I, I really enjoyed that as well. <laughs> That's just funny as well. If you go and check it I, out. I was making up the website a couple of months ago and I'm trying to write, you know, my CV like that. Karen appeared and I'm like, ah, it's fucking me that's saying it. So I might as just be all right, uh, right. Do you know, uh, Karen <laughs> met Meryl Streep. Meryl was like awfully nice to her and things and just put that in. So I tried to make it funny instead, which is more like, Hopefully, what I'm um, really than all the. Oh, there it is. Look at that. That was last week, that photo, two days ago. <laughs> hey! I recommend everyone checks it out. Give me a good laugh as well, because it is that sort of writing about yourself in the third person. You smashed it. It's not an easy thing to do. Thank you very much, Karen. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to yeah. us. Hopefully, Thanks. see you in the real world soon, whether that's DJing, rapping, acting, doing what you do. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, see you soon. Brilliant, you will do. Tell me when that gig is, my DJing gig. The gigs are coming. The gigs are, as soon as I see a real one with my own eyes, I'm yeah. going to be emailing you and asking you to get involved. Free. I mean that. <laughs> First I mean one's that. free. I cut my teeth on it. Amazing. Deal. It's done. Thank, Thank you very much, Karen. All the yeah. best. Karen Dunbar, absolute legend. Check out her website for more information on all the many hats that she wears. 
Uh, we're back tomorrow night with the Mickey Nines, who are uh, going to be talking about their new album, Modern Kunst. I think it's how you pronounce it, which I believe translates as modern art. But you know they're kind of making a cunt joke there as well. But they're a, they're a good bunch of lads. And it's a great album, so we're going to be live here tomorrow at 7. Also, we've got Graham Duff, who the, who wrote Ideal. He's got a new book out with Marky e. Smith. He's done loads of stuff with Alan Partridge. He's a, a DJ. He's, he's done everything. That, that show's actually available on YouTube just now, but we've also turned that into an audio podcast. So if you want to listen to it on Spotify, Apple, or whatever, you can do that as well. Uh, the final shout out to the patrons. This show would not be possible were it not for our patrons. So if you enjoyed tonight's show and you want to help us build this thing that we're building, then you can become a patron for the price of a pint or the price of a cup of coffee. I'll put the link in the comments there. It's patreon.com forward slash you call that radio. And that just helps us do what we do. And we'll give you some bonus material and some prizes as well. Glad I tuned in, says Freda. Bunch of kunst, says Christine. Yes, Mickey Nines are awesome. Rip Torn says, nice one, Mark. Love hearts for Al. Big Al, how you doing, mate? Uh, Ali, nice one, guys. So down to earth. Magic show. Hello, Fiona. Love hearts for Dope Sick Fly. Love hearts for Gavin Mitchell. Get back on here soon, please, pal. Uh, brilliant, Karen and Mark. Hope to hear you in a secret rave, Karen. What's your DJ name? I believe her DJ name is DJ Karen Dunbar. Great show, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Stay true to yourself. You've been so funny tonight. Thanks a lot. Nice one. Just brilliant. Two legends. Thank guy. Thanks, guys. Fake the football. Uh, you're some driver. And yeah, loads of nice comments. Thank you. Sorry if we couldn't read out all your messages. Just too many comments tonight to keep up with it all. Thank you to Karen. And we'll see you tomorrow night for the amazing Mickey Nines. Thank you. Good night. Bye! Is that you, Daniel? Are you before me? Call that radio. You call that radio. Hello? 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 Yes, this is Dawn. Oh,